Okay. Good morning, Patricia. Welcome to our meeting. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we we did the you know the from first part, and now we we do breakout rooms, and we've just gotten back. We'd like to do breakout rooms so that people have some time to to talk in a small group. And it's a great idea. I love it. It's been a great idea. It's made it, people have liked it. I've liked it. Um, but anyway, um, um, Patricia is an artist, and um, I see, as you, I of course, <laughs> I see your red. See some things happening there in the back. Yes. <laughs> so, so we have the red and pink women up front. <laughs> um, but she's a you know a, a, um, a practicing artist and exhibitor, and she's also a very experienced educator and curator. Um, and um, founder of the Crit Lab and Map Spaces. Um, and I believe you work upstate, you were located. I live in Washington Heights in Manhattan, and then I have Map Spaces in Port Chester, has been there for many years. And then I recently um, now have a loft in Peekskill. So oh. I'm like all over the place, but yeah. Okay, and, and from her extensive teaching experience, She's developed um, um, a crit lab and, um, and a lot of experience running critiques and has worked out you know, what makes them run well. So we would love to hear about that from you. Um, okay. And if you wanna say a little bit more about yourself since I said very little. That's, fine. that's okay. I think um, I have a PowerPoint. Um, oh, and so, Make it. so it's, um, it's a little bit adapted from the first part is a little bit adapted. Well, first, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really honored and thrilled to be here with you. What, a, what an amazing group. I only hear amazing things about this group. So I'm really um, happy to be here. I just wish I could so many people. I can't like, <laughs> see everyone at one time, but, um, but hello and um, happy to, 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 to meet you all. Um, I have a PowerPoint that is, so I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to whip through. Hopefully you guys are uh, like, can handle my fast talking. Um, but I, I did a website. The first part's gonna be about websites and then I'll talk about the Crit Lab. So why don't I just jump in um, so we can just, uh, and I'm gonna do a second because I wanna, I have two screens luckily because that means I get to see many more faces at one time on one screen. Um, <clears throat> so I might go through some things. I know this is a pretty sophisticated, um, artist audience. So you're, some of this website stuff might be a little bit, you know, um, not as uh, new to you, but um, I have done a lot of um, website analysis and that has turned into actually like a conceptual analysis of people's practice and how to make that visible. So I'll, that's the kind of framework that I'll talk about it here. Um, this is an, a, an image of the show, recent solo show. I had a Garrison Art Center um, I am, ha I have a show, I know there are some people in this group that are upstate maybe. Um, I have a show opening April 2nd at Jane Street Art Center, which was formerly 11 Jane Street. It's now Jane Street Art Center, opening um, April 2nd. And I will be up there also for a bunch of programming. We're gonna do around lace programming, sewing programming, natural dyes and pigments programming. So um, you can check that out. I'm very excited about it. It'll be some of the work that you see here, but some new things too. This is work that's all dyed with cochineal insect dye. I've been working with natural dyes and pigments, especially ones with long cultural histories for, I don't know, 25 years. Um, so it's a big part of my practice. And the lace archive is something that really came about in the pandemic. And um, when I was working with some family lace and then people found out and they started sending me lace. And so pretty much all of the lace, certainly all of the lace on the big piece on the red piece is all lace that people sent to me. For at first unsolicited. Um, and so it turned into this enormous project, which is the lace archive. So I am documenting every single piece of lace that people send me. And I have boxes and boxes and boxes to still document. There's now an, um, a website and you can find out more about that um, project. It's been amazing. I just opened another box with some really beautiful letters from people about their grandmothers and, you know, the people who cared for this lace, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's now my recent obsession is this. And there's all, I mean, I'm not gonna talk about my work so much here, but there's lots of stuff in there about the history of domestic labor, hidden labor of women, hidden labor of care, um, 
as well as some environmental stuff that, that's in there too. But I'm here not to talk about me. Um, so the Crit Lab is an organization that, in, you know, it's funny, I, 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 one of the things I say a lot in the Crit Lab is pay attention to what shows up. <laughs> and um, people showed up in my studio, <laughs> started with like five people wanting to do monthly critiques. And uh, now I have between 50 and 60 people every semester. Um, and I have the Alt MFA, which is a four day conference uh, where I invite lots of other faculty to come in and do small group critiques, um, lectures, collaborative projects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, it, and now we have a, re a residency in Italy, which we are yay, going again. Um, we went in 2019 for the first one and we're going in June. Um, the first residency is already full. So I'm really excited to get back to Italy. So I will come back to the Crit Lab um, in more detail um, in a bit. This is a Crit Lab exhibition that is opening this Saturday in Porchester, if you're anywhere near. It's also one block from the train station, the Metro North train station. Um, and there's another fantastic art space called Ice Cream Social that has recently opened in Porchester. Uh, and so they will be open during, and they have a fantastic exhibition. I have a piece in there and a couple of other Crit Labbers also have uh, work in that show, uh, Susan Luss and Theo Trotter. So that should be a pretty, so you can, you know, if you want a Porchester day, you can do both. And actually the Newberger Museum is also five minutes there. So it, it'd be a nice art day. Anyway, that opens this Saturday and very excited about that. Curated that with um, Gabby Collins Fernandez. Um, I'm also a curator. So this is a recent show that I curated, uh, Haptic Somatic. I've done a bunch of shows around art and technology. Um, this is a fantastic show, which, um, you're interested, I can talk about another time. This is, a, I also am very interested in environmental issues and artists who engage with that. So this was a show related to Solastalgia, which is grief for the land, artists who, um, whose work engages in that. And I, this was a, quite a few years ago, but I always have to show it because we only recently lost Amy Lipton. Um, and I'm sure some of you knew her and she was an amazing, amazing curator and um, one of the curators of Eco Art Space, which is still a pretty wonderful active organization. So we co-curated this exhibition, was really fantastic. So in honor of Amy, I always wanna give that a shout out. Um, so uh, websites, I started to do this, uh, uh, and if, I might go through a couple of these quickly, just um, you know, just give a shout if, if it's too quick or too slow. Um, I started doing website analysis and it was started like people wanting help with, you know, does this work? How, you know, what's the practicalities, et cetera, et cetera. And I realized that it was, it, websites are really inside our, um, the ways that we make our work visible to the world. I mean, that seems obvious. And at the same time, it is, um, it really makes, as a curator, as someone who looks at hundreds of websites sometimes, um, you really get a sense of how and when artists are, are making their vision um, visible to you. Uh, some artists organize their work by in different ways, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But so a website is a story, the story of your work, and it's not unconnected to my development of a um, digital pedagogy, if you will, uh, a way to think about how we function in the digital space as artists because of this shift with COVID has pushed us kind of preter, like a little bit prematurely, perhaps not, but a little bit pushed us a little bit, thrust us more quickly into the future of kind of hybrid and online and kind of ways of working in that space. And I think, I don't know about you, but I'm sure um, many of you were as surprised as the Crit Lab was when we went online and everyone was like, no, we can't do this. We can't possibly talk about work online. And I thought, you know, I don't know, let's think about this more deeply. So we'll talk about the digital pedagogy as well. So what does it mean to be an object maker in the digital space as someone who makes what are often subtle, tactile, <laughs> complex things that don't always communicate well in a digital space. I really wanted to think about that really carefully. Um, so the, one of the things that I, I sort of, one of the ways that I began to think about that is that we have thought in the past um, that the website and pictures of our work was a form of documentation. And I wanna shift, I wanna shift our thinking, or I thought like shifting the thinking was going to be helpful. Instead of thinking of it as documentation, thinking of it as representation. Any digital representation of your work is an access point to the real 
It's an access point to the real. So it's not a documentation in the way that we would have thought even five years ago, right? We have to shift our, our thinking. Um, and thinking about how you can represent your work in the digital space can be really helpful in making your work uh, more visible. And I mean visible in ways that are meaningful to you, right? Like who do you want to see your work? What do you want people to understand about your work, et cetera, et cetera. So reading images in the digital space requires translation. So this is a kind of metaphor that I like to use. So if your work is like Connie Brown's wonderful work, which is on view at the Painting Center um, right now, which is a solo show there, if your work is brightly colored, saturated, hard edge, um, graphic, um, then the translation, there's always a translation loss. Nothing looks like it looks in real life. So let's just disabuse ourselves of that notion. This is not a replication. Digital space is a different space. And if we think of it as a different space, then we can function inside of it in ways that can be really productive for us as artists. So, uh, for, so Connie's work translates really well in the digital space, right? It has these components that the digital space, that's a good translation. It's not exactly like seeing it in for real, there's surface things, et cetera, et cetera. However, that trans, so there's always a translation loss, but I think of the translation losses here as being something like translating from Italian into Spanish, right? They're both romance languages, they have the same grammatical structure, they share a lot of words, right? But they're not the same language, but it's um, that translation loss is lower. If you're someone like Caroline McMoran or myself, for example, you know, that translation loss is much wider. And so it, it is really our responsibility as artists to think through that translation loss. What is necessary for me to represent in order for the translation loss to be to be um, communicated? So. Um, this is more like translating, you know, Russian into Italian, right? Like different alphabet, right? Different grammatical structure, et cetera, et cetera. And so it is the artist's responsibility for, you know, better or worse, we have many more responsibilities um, than we probably should, but that's the world. Uh, and so for Caroline, it means that one has to um, do, you know, has to think about that translation loss much more carefully. And so having installation shots, having ways that someone can get a sense of the detail as well as the whole is really, and the materiality, representing materiality in the digital space is uh, for, you know, for someone who works with in like a material culture artist, uh, that materiality is really important. Um, so it, this is the artist Lee, uh, Lisi Orjuela, and these are oil paintings, which you know you would think oil paintings translate quite well in the digital space. It's very gestural, very tactile. This painting is quite large. One of the things that's very difficult to see in the digital space because it equalizes everything, which is both a positive thing when we're in the Zoom room, right? We're all we all have a front row seat. We're all equal. We're all sort of that. In many ways, that that Zoom space is incredibly powerful. Um, for an artwork, it can be difficult, and so um, a context shot which shows you know the world the work lives in can be incredibly powerful to give a sense of the objectness of these things um so another thing that i'm telling artists um even an artist like connie brown whose translation loss is going to be smaller that there's still a loss and one of the things that we did traditionally all of us was we cropped we cropped stuff right um and i want to just tell you right now to stop cropping <laughs> this is my if you take nothing else um, away from this today, I think the cropping is um, a really powerful because cropping is a flattening mechanism and the digital space is already a flattening space. And so therefore cropping further flattens. It also uh, takes away some of the uh, physicality, the objectness, right? A painting is still an object. It's not a digital, um, I mean, digital material is still material. Uh, let's get real. It's not abstract. It's actually material, but it's material that's light-based and inside the screen. A painting is an object. And so even though this is quite subtle, um, photographing the painting with an inch of wall around it, right? With like the shadow and everything else, also seeing the edge, the edge of a painting is super important. When you crop, you are inevitably going to have to crop some of that painting off. Seeing the objectness can be really powerful. Again, you are giving me access to the real. You, the most important thing is to place the viewer's body, body, think of this, in relationship to the work. We are sort of savvy lookers once we have access, right? So when we place, when we do something that allows a, uh, a viewer to place their body in relationship to the work, it can be, it will carry through a lot of other images. So details are also incredibly important. And this is, you know, less true of paintings, but not entirely not true, right? If you have a tactile surface and something is really important, the detail is incredibly important. Now, details are not just, details in the digital space have a very large job. And this is true in your website, but it is also true if you're writing proposals, right? You're sending, you're writing a proposal for an exhibition or a grant. 
you know, what do we have to show in order for people to understand what they are looking at, right, as a physical thing? And so a detail has a multi, it has a multifaceted function, right? It is both the, a detail of the thing, it both tells us something about the thing that we are looking at, right? And it also needs to tell something about the objects that will follow. So that once I've seen one detail, and I see the next thing, I'm like, oh, I understand what I'm looking at now. And I can translate that in other images. So for me, like a, for mine, a, like a lace close up, you might see this big thing and be like, well, I kind of can see what it is. The detail will inform the person. We'll say, oh, I understand what this is that I'm looking at so that every image after we understand. So this is a detail shot. And also a detail shot should not replicate something that is in the main image, right? In other words, you wanna show something that's hard to see in the, in the primary image and something that tells us something about that work and um, not just about that work, but about your practice. Um, so an artist like Sylvie, uh, Erica Roth, that was Sylvia Vandersloos was the last one. Um, Erica Roth makes these very large entangled installations which look amazing in pictures. And yet it can also be hard to see what the, um, what the kind of material actually is. And so detail shots like this, um, and these are again, just examples, but um, can show that this is this kind of <laughs> like insanely wild, incredible tangle of ribbon and beads and, and all kinds of stuff. So we get a sense of the monumentality of it. We get a sense of the kind of um, the way that it's made up of small parts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is, a, this is a screenshot of Caroline's um, website, which um, was, I showed her work earlier in the translation, right? So this is an amazing um, detail shot, right? Because it gives us both information about the scale. Like we understand that there's a larger work that this is perhaps an installation shot. And yet her work has all of these very minute, delicate, you know, very articulated details that are really hard to see in an installation shot. So this is a great, and also I think a great landing page for a website, but a really good detail shot because it doesn't just show the detail. It also gives you a sense Right? It gives us information about her practice overall. Um, studio shots are really great. And I think that thinking of a website as a kind of a space, almost like a house. I think of, I'm so visual. I think of everything in sort of visual terms. Um, you know, if your website is a house, the website has, gives you the opportunity to, um, to bring people into different kinds of rooms. And so um, this kind of shot tells you a lot about the individual work, but also about the practice overall. So it's a really powerful um, shot. And here's a detail shot, Susan Luss's work, um, where you have a real sense of, you know, not like the individual object on its own, but how it lives inside the artist's vision. We get really good detail about what these things are made of, and also a lot of information about the kind of way that those fit inside an installation vision or the vision of an installation artist. An installation artist may often have, you know, a quite a challenging time representing that work in the digital space. Um, so you can have formal shots, exhibition shots, I highly recommend. This is uh, Adria Arch, is a Boston artist, and, um, um, and studio shots showing works in progress. These are really, I think of this as like, you know, you might have in your website, you have like the parlor, which might be the, the exhibition spaces, right? The formal, the formal kind of thing. You have the living room is like the portfolio, and then you have the kind of kitchen, which is your studio shots, right? So there is different kinds of spaces that you can invite people into to see the work um, in different ways. Uh, studio shots are always great, I think, because they tell you a lot about the artists. I mean, you know a lot about these two artists just by looking at this studio shot. Um, and also, of course, studio portraits. I think it's great to have, um, you know, a picture of your, I'm not one for the like formal, you know, sort of, you know, studio portrait. I'm more, I think that the portraits of you know, a picture of you in your studio is always really engaging. Then I feel connected. I have a representation of, you know, the artists, like I can put my body in that, in relationship to that work in a more um, meaningful way. Um, so these are just some examples. Um, and so the website is a space. How do you want to invite people in, right? Like, what do you want them to see? What's important to be on the homepage? What's, what's important to, um, how is it important to organize these things? Um, I think that very often when I'm working with artists on websites, they organize things by year or by media. And in general, there's always exceptions to every single thing I, I will say today, but um, organizing by year or by media is generally not the most, uh, the best way in my experience of making your work visible. I think works on paper is the exception because works on paper is both a media and also a kind of a form, like an aesthetic form, right? Um, but 
Uh, because I think when you go by year, it's sort of like, I don't know, it places this, and nobody wants to sort of just see like a doom scroll of images. We want them to be curated for us. So, you know, you want to curate your website. Um, so um, your vision is always your guiding light, right? Like, who are you as an artist? What are you, you know, what is your aesthetic and conceptual vision? That is the primary thing under which all of the stuff inside the website wants to be organized. And when it is, then I see your vision and I understand like as a curator, for example, um, you know, I get a sense of who the artist, like what the artist is thinking about as, as an artist. So you can have different kinds of spaces, an exhibition space, right? Which would be the more formal portfolio space. You can have a studio visit, which might be images of you in your studio. Um, you can have a shop. Uh, I tend to think that a shop and a um, portfolio pages we might like to be separate because if I'm a curator, I'm not really interested in going see, to see things that say, you know, buy me on them. I'm much more interested in seeing like the conceptual vision and have a shop separate, you know? Um, but think about what it is that you want um, people to see. You get to frame the narrative. Like we are the ones who get to decide um, what we want to be visible in the work. Um, so I've already said this. So, you, you know, you can have curatorial informational right, like texts around your work, personal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the portfolio is really like, that's the most important thing, right? Your portfolio is the most important thing because you're an artist, it's the work, it's all about the work. So don't crop, um, lists of materials. I, I tell people not to use the term mixed media, um, like don't run home feeling bad, but um, when I'm looking at something in the digital space and it says mixed media, if I can't tell what it is, like I actually don't, you know, I can't tell because it's not visible in the images, then I will tend to give it a pass. Um, show the physicality, right? Like give some kinds of ways, figure out ways for people to understand what is this object. Because basically um, the picture, you know, it's our job to kind of make the picture um, tell the story of the work and not just be this sort of like, okay, I took a picture and that's it. Like, does the picture really represent the, the object? Um, so sometimes a context shot like can have, you know, a chair or a window or wall. There are those apps, I think I have a picture. Um, there are those apps where you can place your work in, you know, a space with like a plant and a table and a chair. I think those are fine for more like the selling part of your website. I don't find them as useful for a portfolio. I mean, like something a little bit more neutral, like gallery type of space to show context, I think is, is um, powerful. So, um, so these are, I'm sure that, you know, this savvy group already knows all of this, but these are the kinds of things that you're going to have on your website. You might have other pages. It depends on what kind of things that you do. Someone like I, I do curating and teaching. So I, you know, I have to think really carefully about how to keep my work visible when I have all these other complicated things, um, going on. So, um, so just to, you know, briefly some examples of, you know, this is a homepage. Now she is organizing these by year, which I'm not really a big fan of, but um, her work is very consistent. So, because I don't think, I think that we think in bodies of ideas, which is really the way that um, we think, I think in, you know, in the Crit Lab, we think through, through the, um, uh, through the artworks is that we're thinking in bodies of ideas rather than like this year I made that. Um, but these are just examples of like ways to have a portfolio visible on the front page. Um, Rita Moss's work is quite conceptual, like, and very sort of austere so that her homepage really reflects that, right? It looks like the work. Um, and, you know, I'm a little, this is my partner, so I'm a little biased. And I also designed that website, uh, or, well, it's still in progress. But, you know, something about this really tells you something about the kind of artist he is, right? Um, and there are things like a, a splash page. I'm sure some of you know Patricia Fabricant. And the splash page is kind of like a landing page that is, it's a, like, a, like a, almost like a gate before you get into the website. Um, so one has to click uh, again to get into the, what is the actual homepage. I think landing sites are, you know, um, are perfectly fine. I think it just depends on whether you think having an additional click is productive. Sometimes people use landing pages as a place to put like news, like upcoming exhibitions or something like that. Um, so again, you get to craft the, um, the, the, uh, you get to craft the narrative. Uh, so, you know, you need to update your site because people think we're dead, you know, <laughs> they, go to a, they go to a website and it hasn't been updated. Um, the, look out for duplicating, um, like this is, this is maybe a little more in the weeds than we'll do now, but um, like people often have a homepage and their name as a homepage link. That's a duplication that's unnecessary, right? So like, look for those kinds of duplications. Drop downs, like if you, let me see. 
here's a, I don't know if this is a drop down or not, but you know, a drop down, like when, then when it would drop down and there would be a list of, of titles. To me, I find drop downs, um, I don't, I'm not a fan of drop downs. And the reason is because you're making me uh, have to like blindly make a choice. Okay, I guess I'll pick this one. Whereas if you have a grid like this, I can go, oh, okay, I wanna go to this page. Um, so I think that I'm not a fan of drop downs. Um, Contact forms on your website are only useful if you actually get that email. And I, as a curator, have don't use, I will never email someone through a contact form because to be perfectly honest, I have never, ever, ever gotten a response. So I recommend you can have contact forms, but make sure you know where that contact form is going and that you check it. And I would also have your email there. Um, I will always copy the email because also if I do a contact form, I don't have a record of it. Do you know what I mean? If I'm a curator and I'm emailing someone for a thing, I, like I do it through a contact form, there's no record for me. So I'll be like, you know, who's going to remember it next week? I'm like, did I email that artist or not? I don't know. Um, so these are just some things, um, you know, don't have like every image open in a new tab. That's really frustrating. These are simple kind of settings in the website. Um, <laughs> that I recommend to kind of just, again, it's legibility and that once you have the vision intact, then it's all about legibility and navigability, like things that you want visible and then ways for people to navigate that are um, simple and, and clear. And there are these apps. Um, I can always send this information to you guys, um, but just apps for like placing your work into um, situations. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the Crit Lab now. Um, uh, the and I'm you know take, happy to take questions about website stuff um, at any point. So the Crit Lab is um, this organization that again happened to me with five artists and has grown without really me doing much of anything except um, really crafting a, a very strong pedagogy. Um, I think that critique is essential for all artists. It doesn't mean the Crit Lab is essential. I just mean that basically critique is in some way, the work is circulating inside of conversations, right? So I give an example of um, a friend who is not an artist, is like has another profession, but does photography on the side. And he was commenting, uh, someone made some comment about like, you know, you only make money when you're like, like, can we support living artists? And he said, I don't know, you know, when I, when I didn't have money, now I have all the best equipment and my work is not really any better than it was when I was young and poor and, you know, was making work. And I, I was like, hmm, how do I respond to this? Well, I think actually that it's not because of he has, suddenly has good equipment because I don't buy into the starving artist, uh, you know, sort of um, like, myth, let's say, right? That we do better work when we're kind of suffering. I think that's that's not true um, in a general way. But I really, what I thought was, well, it's because your work is not circulating. Do you know what I mean? It's not inside of a discourse. And so being inside of a discourse means a lot of different things. It can mean if your work is, you know, you're showing on a regular basis, people are writing about the work, people are looking at the work, that's a form of being in a critical discourse, right? Um, and the, the studio is a pretty isolated place, right? And needs to be, right? Um, and so I can't tell you how powerful it is, and I, you guys all know because this is what you're doing here, right? How powerful it is to get together with a group of artists and talk about your work. I mean, it just, the minute the work gets looked at, it changes, right? So at some point we need to come out of our studios. Um, so I'm really clear that the Crit Lab is not, I'm not, I'm not the teacher. These are not students, they are working artists. Um, I don't use that language. I'm not interested in that language. Um, I have a lot, I bring, this is the way that I would talk about it is that I bring a lot to the table. I have a lot of experience, a lot of expertise, you know, a lot of, I've done a lot of work on this, but I, I don't own, I bring a lot to the table, but I don't own the table. We all come to the table with, you know, whatever our, um, all the things that we, our expertise and, and, and our knowledge and everything else. So trying to craft a very intentional kind of space um, where work can be talked about. Um, so, um, Oh, well, just some things you can look at the Crit Lab website, but everyone gets, you know, a portfolio page. There's sort of um, perks. We have a private Facebook group, um, but I'm really here to talk more about critique than, than about the lab in particular. I, I think that I'm, a, you know, one of the, the sort of, um, we're going to make Crit Lab t-shirts and people keep like coining some, picking up on some things that we say, like there's a pedagogy for that is a phrase, a, a favorite phrase of mine. I'm kind of a pedagogy nerd. So uh, I really believe in structure. So the thing that I think is powerful about the Crit Lab, and I, by the way, I advocate anybody, like anybody can form a critique group. I think, and every, and every, I recommend it to every artist, right? To find some community of artists, small community of artists that you can talk about your work with. It's so, so powerful. The Crit Lab is 
particular in its own way because it's run very much like a graduate seminar. Um, so it has very formal, a very formal pedagogy, which is language based. And so that keeps the keeps it from keeps it kind of the conversations at a fairly high level um, and um, keeps them from being, um, you know, purely subjective conversations, which I, you know, have their place, right? I think there's all different ways that we can talk about our work. So it's not that one is better, they're just different. And really clear about when we step into the crit lab, we are stepping into a certain kind of reflective critical space and we step in and we step out. <laughs> so um, it's uh, the, some of the primary things about the, um, the, the lab are that we focus on the work, not the artist. We don't really, intent is not the primary conversation because once that thing leaves your studio, all your intentions may just go out the window. Um, we talk about intent in relationship to if you feel like your intent is not visible in the work and it's really important for it to be visible for you, then we can talk about how that work might want to shift. But we meet the work. We meet the work as a kind of verb, you know, an autonomous object in the world. And we, we kind of say, well, Hello, you know, who are you? What are you all about? What are the materials doing? What are the discourses, um, you know, circulating inside this work? Material discourses, cultural discourses, aesthetic discourses, political discourses, social discourses. They are all in every single work and sometimes in larger and smaller degrees. So we sort of unpack the discourses in a, in a sort of dispassionate way uh, without talking about, um, you know, you can't say, I like this, I don't like this, which is really hard. It's a training, right? All the euphemisms. I enjoy, I appreciate, right? People try and slip all of those in. Um, but the reason for that is if I say to you, this apple is delicious, this is my really banal example, but if I say to you, this apple is delicious, you know a lot about me and you know absolutely nothing about that apple. And so it's not that useful to know that I like this or I don't like this because we all kind of respond and conclude in different ways. Um, so if I say this apple is crisp and sweet and fresh, then I have a lot of information about the apple, which I could deduce that I might think that this apple is delicious and maybe you do too, but I don't, uh, but now I know a lot about the apple. And so shifting the conversation to, um, to the observation rather than the conclusion is really powerful. Uh, it's really, really powerful. And if someone says, you know, observe something or feels like they're, you know, they feel a light coming on, um, then I would say like locate that response in the work in very like specifically, like find that place in the work that is causing you to have that response, right? So if you like a melancholy feel in a work, I would say, well, locate that melancholy in the work. This gives the artists an enormous amount of you know, really practical. I'm a very like pragmatic. We got to have pragma pragmatic solutions for the studio because life is hard, time is short, and we have a lot to do, right, as artists. And so I really want to create structures that can be taken back to the studio and used in really productive ways. Part of how the critique pedagogy came about was my own frustration with some of the critiques I had had, right? Like, it's always great to have a conversation about your work, but I would come back to the studio and I'd be like, oh, it just all sort of slipped through my fingers. I couldn't really, you know, or I felt that people were just not seeing or not reading or, or kind of just being like, oh, you know, giving me their opinion. And I didn't feel like that was useful. And so I wanted to create a kind of language structure that, um, was really useful. One of the things about, and some of these things are, you know, these are not, I didn't invent all of these things. The like, don't like is a fairly common critique um, guideline. I think the one of the things that, a um, couple of things that I feel like are a bit unique to the lab are like, I always say, don't should on people. Like don't people tell people, you should do this. You should make it bigger. You should add more yellow. You should do, that just drives me crazy. I, 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 don't, um, I don't feel like I have ever responded well to that kind of um, information, but I might frame it a bit more like, um, what are the potentialities that exist in this work at any given time, right? So what, what might a scale shift do? How, how might the color language change or come closer to the things that you're wanting to be visible, that kind of, so it's not that we don't talk about things you might do in the work, it's just not, none of this kind of should stuff. And then the other thing, and I think I'll gonna stop in a minute, are um, the biggest, one of the biggest things that I think I'm, I'm sort of most proud of is to, to shift the question why to what. We are always asked, why did you use this? Why? And there's also a famous, I can't remember who the artist is, like the famous why list, you know, why paint, why color, why green, why this? And see, uh, seemingly that at the end of that, you have a good understanding of, of your work. But I think the why, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with the why, but we live in a very over-psychologized 
uh, culture and my experience of the why is that people always go to their own motivation. Oh, and I was five, you know, I fell out of a tree and now I paint trees. And I just think it's really, really reductive. I don't know that we ever really know why. Like, do I really know why the lace has become this intense fascination for me? I, I mean, I understand the context within which that interest developed, but you know, some of it is inexplicable even to me. And I feel like the what protects the kind of inchoate and, and mysterious part of the creative process. It doesn't ask us to dissect it. It just says, you know, it just is. So I would say, what is it that you love? What can you not stop thinking about? What keeps showing up in the work? What do you want to touch? Like it's the what, what do those materials say? What do they do? What are their histories? What are their contexts? And all of that. And that really yields some pretty productive work um, stuff. So, okay, <laughs> I've whisked through that. <laughs> I whizzed through that, so <laughs> I hope that um, I wanted to make sure there was a little bit of time for questions so, and discussion. I know it's a big group, but um, Wow, yeah. thank you. That wow. Was that, was, that, wow. Was, that was really packed information. It will take us a while to digest all that. I know I threw a lot in. I'm sorry. But no, that, I appreciate it. That's, um, really that's one of my, that's one of my, both my, like, it's both one of my strengths and one of my weaknesses because your strength is always your weakness. Right, right. right. I, I have a question. Thing. I mean, yeah. I know there's lots of questions, but in terms of your crit labs, when you form your groups, like mm -hmm. I'm curious how you think about who's in what group or what a good number is like to make yeah. an interesting working group of people. Yeah, so this is the way it works is really um, specific. So um, you can't sign up for a particular lab, you sign up for the lab in general, and then right. I curate the groups. It mm -hmm. is like a torturous, arduous process for me, but it is it, it ends up, um, and I look at every single person's work, I look at their websites, and then I sort of put people together in ways that I think, I mean, I take into account people have, you know, people are like, oh, I would really like to be in a group with primarily painters or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that um, I put together people who, not for pers the person's personality, but for the work, like what work is going to really have a dynamic conversation that's really going to learn from one another. And I tell you, the, the effect has been incredible. I mean, the conversations are these group. And so the groups are, it's a five month program. There are maximum seven people in each group, the same seven people for the five months. Um, we meet on Zoom, which has been amazing because as challenging as we thought it was and, you know, March of 2020, where everyone was like, oh, we can't do this, um, which is why I sat down and thought, well, there's a pedagogy for the digital space. There's a way that we can use the digital space. Um, and again, we're all in the front row, right? We're all equal, right? We all have a front row seat. There, you can't hang back. We're all, I think we're all like mind and heart in the digital space. Right. Really, I think it's really powerful. And so also, if you're someone who talks all the time, like someone like me, um, in the digital space, you're really aware, like when you're talking all the time. And if you're someone who's, you know, shy or more introspective, um, you're, you know, you really feel compelled to kind of, well, I got to speak up, you know, I got to speak up. So it really makes a lot of space for people, I think, in, in really different, you know, different kinds of um, communicators have a lot of, um, like, are really empowered to, to, to speak. And because the groups are small, there's a lot of trust built over the time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, and I have two kinds of groups. I have main labs, which is, sort of what you know everyone would do if they first and then I have next level labs which is not it's not about like these are like better artists or anything like that it's just that people who have been engaged in a, this kind of critical discourse for some time you know are somewhat familiar because you might not be right like if you didn't go to graduate school and even if you did you might have gone to a graduate school where that kind of critical discourse was not part of the program or it's been a really long time or whatever so um the the groups are really curated by the work so that's a very long answer to a simple question. No, that, that's important because it does make a difference. I mean, and so you meet the people, so you have a little sense of who they are and their work. And do you ever turn people away? Um, I, I have, it's only, no, not really, but I will, I mean, you know, I try not, I really want this to be, I mean, I feel like everybody can come to this table. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't have a kind of hierarchical, like my politics are that everyone can have these conversations. Sometimes we need, you know, it's a special, it's like a, it's a, it's philosophy basically, right? It's like critical, critical theory is a kind of philosophy. So we sometimes need a little language training. Um, but uh, I have had to recently somewhat limit because of my own schedule. Um, 
the number of um, the number of people. But I think that I can put people together where they can really learn from one another. And right. and one thing that I really am proud of again is that the structure is so strong, like strong and yet fungible, which is the best kind of structure, right? Mm -hmm. Like it holds everybody in a space where they can they can. Um, they can really become part of the conversation, even if it's really nascent for them. I have some people who are really just starting out as artists, and then I have a lot of people who have MFAs. So, and everybody, um, there's, I think there's, you know, a place at, at the table for everybody, so. Is there a facilitator amongst those five people? That would be me. Oh, <laughs> that's, oh my God. That's I lead all of the groups, but wow. I will tell you that one of my goals is that, so the way that it works just in practical terms is that, um, you have one critique a month. So every month you get five, you know, you get five critiques over the five months, although we meet in two sessions so that we're not like sitting in a seven hour Zoom. Um, and they're, they're like 25 plus 10 minutes. So they're about 35 to 40 minutes each focused entirely on your work. We start out with a very strict, like two to four minutes of just looking at the work silently before we hear anything. And then we go into discussion. And I think that um, the, um, the first 20 minutes or so, I try, I don't really say very much. Like I really, and, and people really, you know, except, you know, if there's newer people or whatever facilitate, but I, it's not, I'm not leading this. I'm sort of guiding and facilitating. And then I will come back at the end and kind of bring in some, you know, sort of maybe artists that people should look at. We, we craft artist families to help us understand the discourses that we're engaged in um, and all of that. Um, so, so yeah, it's uh, the people. The really, I don't really have any group where people don't really take it on and start really doing most of the talking for themselves. So that's great. Okay. And I saw that someone asked if there was a fee. And yes, this is a tuition-based program. I do have a fellowship, um, and the show that we have coming up now, part of the proceeds of that will go to fund more fellowships. And we have we have one fellowship for the labs and one for the Alt MFA. I'm hoping to expand that. And at the same time, I am a real advocate for artists being paid for their work. And so I, uh, you know, I'm always saying, like, we should be, we should make visible the labor of artists. So I'm always very um, transparent about that and, and the ways that I think that that both empowers and disempowers us in the ways we talk about, um, you know, the, the, the sort of some of the really kind of problematic ecosystems of the art world, right, of all the art worlds, because there's right. many. So, um, yeah. We are very familiar with them. <laughs> Exactly. I know. I know. This group yeah. is. Um, so let's see. I, I'm sure I'm sure there are a hundred questions from people because also I see a hand up with no me. OK, I can only see one page at a time, so I will rely on you to. to... You need to unmute. No, me, I'm mute. Yeah. OK. Um, I have a question because so you talk about in terms of uh, website arrangement, how you sort of mm -hmm. quantify things in terms of doing it for curatorial uh, eyes, not not my eyes. Sure. Uh, my work sort of rotates be or wanders between 2D and 3D work. So mm -hmm. at the moment, it's arranged by printmaking, drawing, painting, sculpture. So, so the thought of arranging it by sort of thematic groups is is more is better for a potential person who looks and says oh i'm looking for a show on homelessness or i'm looking for a show on whatever it is sort of a better and just intermix the pieces within that because they're all sort of revolving on the same thing yeah i mean it's it, you know it's 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 like there's no one like pithy answer do you know what i mean because yeah. every, everybody's work is so particular right yeah right. um so i it doesn't i mean it's it's not like terrible to organize up by media but uh -huh. I think that I think that there's probably I mean I if I sat down with you and your website we would look at the things and kind of talk about that like how right. are the ways that this is organizing I'm not saying that you need to um you know ask me to right, do that right, but right, I'm, right. I'm saying that if you look at it from that perspective then you know it, are there sort of series that organize themselves around similar themes but yet might mm -hmm. be in different media right um, I, I mean, I think you can make a case for organizing it by media. I don't think mm -hmm. there's not a case to be made for that. I right. just think it's often um, a little bit sort of like automatic that people do it that way. And it doesn't always, like when I go to someone's website, I wanna know who they are as an artist. I don't necessarily, right. like we are not our media. The right. media is the language that we use to communicate our vision. So right. thinking about the vision, and then if you thought about the vision, how is everything in the, inside that vision organized right. um, under that? So if you, if you were to look at my website by media, that would give you far more 
guideline or guidance as to who I am rather than, oh, she's a sculptor or she's a drawer or she's a this or that. It, it's, it's because I have themes that recur. So. Right, I, you know, again, it's really, um, it's difficult to say without looking. I mean, I, 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 I yeah. often do these with a group of people. So we do the website analysis together because you really yeah. learn a lot from that. But yeah. I think that, um, I think it's, you know, our media, we are not defined by our media. Right. We are defined by our vision. The media is the right. language. I don't mean it's not important because yeah, I'm, no, 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 I understand that, I'm yeah. a material culture person, right? Like the, yeah. the materials I use are primary content in the work. Right. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, organize mine by like lace and not lace. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. I, feel like mm -hmm. I organize it more by bodies of work. You're right. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank that's you. A, like mm -hmm. that's an answer without an answer, right? Yeah. 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 No. 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 But it, it's giving me something to think about because my, like you said, my instinct is okay. Here's my sculpture. Here's my drawings. Here's my paintings, right. and that's a bit, um, I guess, not helpful maybe in a way, I mean, you know, it's I, I get that, right? I don't like, know, I, mean, I don't know, just thinking about yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, I think just try and like, it might mean that nothing changes, but I think just try and step back and look at like, the is yeah. the vision of the artist visible or is the media the most visible thing? Right, right. So okay. I think, um, yeah, I see okay. like, is it Peggy? Yes, um, I wanted to know, I saw one of the websites, Patricia Fabricant, and she shows the same pattern and different colors. Would that be considered redundant or should it be only a few of that pattern and uh, and colors? So yeah. I don't, like, I I don't, don't want to comment on like an individual artist's work, but I would say that one of the things I would think about is how much space is between them, right? So I might be inclined to spread those um, images apart a bit for the reasons that you're talking about. Well, it was more like a calendar, one, you know, one right next to the other. Right, I think space between things is also discursive space. Um, it's meaning making space. So space between things is meaning making space. So if things are really close together, it does kind of, you know, it might um, preclude some more, like meaning kind of rolling around a bit more is the way well, I would phrase it. I thought it was up there, like you select one of these and you'll see it larger. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. Um, I just was using examples of how people organize a homepage. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I think that I, these are all really important things. And by the way, I mean, I go back to my website every like <laughs> six months and rearrange it, right? Because it's an active living space and I want to, you know, things change and I want different things to be visible. And, um, and sometimes I think, why did I put it that way? You know, like, well, that didn't make sense. I mean, I curated a show recently and like, it was so buried in the website. I was like, that's not working. I want this to be more visible, right? I want it to be more findable. So, you know, they are kind of living things um, in that sense. And I see that someone um, asked about tuition. Tuition right now is um, 550 and 650 for the, um, or 550 and 600, but it may, between 550 and 650 for the five month program. And you, you get a portfolio page, an opportunity to sell your work in the shop, um, access to the private Facebook group for which you have lifetime access. I don't, I don't kick anybody off the island, um, even if you do it once. Um, and so I'm happy to talk to people about it if um, they are interested. And you apply by just filling out an application. And then I, if I don't know you, I might call you, you know, we might have a conversation. We might talk about the work. I might look at the work and um, on, I mean, I definitely look at the work on the website and everything else, but we might have a conversation to see what you know, you're thinking about. Um, so how do you organize work that has similar themes, but the materials are different? Um, you know, that's a question from Olga. How do you organize work that has similar themes, but the materials are different, so the, the similar themes are not immediately apparent to the public? I think, you know, the framing of the work is, you know, for better or worse, right, is the job we have. We have a lot of administrative jobs now as artists, right, in today's world. Um, and it, so there's a lot of labor there. Um, I mean, I just say that because I'm really, really aware of it. Um, it's work to do this. Um, but I think that I would, the way I would say it without looking at the work is, is to kind of, what is the, you know, your artist statement is your, is kind of your vision statement, right? It's the organizing principle. And a good artist statement is a very powerful scaffolding upon which these structures can be built. Um, and so uh, I think when you have, you know, I have like an artist statement that is kind of an overarching statement. And then I might have individual statements for different projects. But if you think that the vision is the overarching thing and think about how those things relate 
to the vision, that will help you to organize the work in a way. Um, and yes, I can make, I know I talk, talked really fast because I wanted to be sure we had time. I'm happy to um, give you guys a PDF of that presentation um, if that's helpful for sure. Yeah, you can email it to me and then I'll pass it on to David for the chat notes. Thank you. Um, and it is 11 o'clock. I mean, you're, you're welcome to stay and answer questions or, you know, I know. I know I'm happy to stay for a little bit if people have questions or, or, or jump off, whatever works for you guys. You don't, don't feel obligated to come up with questions <laughs> if anybody has any. Um... I see Peggy again, again, I can only see one page. So if there are people on other pages, like I when, think the hand, if you use the hand thing, then it will pop up on the front page. When, uh, when you look at an artist's work, how do you cl uh, collect their images? Do you slide them off or something like that? And, and do you mean, do you mean if I'm curating a show and I want to collect images in a folder? Um, I mean, there's a lot of practical things about the website that I didn't talk about, like viewing programs, like light, there's like, you know, there's sort of like the ones where there's a group of images below and the things scroll by. There's lots of different ways. One of the things I, I will right click and save the image. So some people don't want that on their website and you can set it up so it doesn't do that, but that's the way I would do it. Um, and I would encourage people to make sure, and I don't always do this myself. So like, um, cause it's a lot, of, you know, we have all this work, but I would, if you, um, before you upload your images to your website, I would have your name in the file name. Cause if I download some images and there's, it's just like IMG, you know, three, two, four, five, then I might go back and be like, who was that artist? You know what I mean? It's just a little, yeah. Uh, someone says, so the jury shows don't want uncropped work. I don't think, I think that's a misnomer. It's that they don't want like to see your furniture in the picture, right? I don't think that they care if there's an inch of wall around it because I've gotten this question before. And also you get to decide what is the best way for your work to be visible, not them. So I recommend that if you're, if they say we want cropped work, I would say, you know, add that inch anyway. I mean, that's my, you know, maybe there's some shows that will think that's bad, but I think most of the time they're talking about like, you know, I, as a juror or a curator, I've seen stuff where, you know, people's furniture is in the picture. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think that's what they're referring to. Did I see someone else's hand? Um, yeah, I think David. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Um, thank you, Patricia. This is great info and, and lots of it. Um, I'm curious, uh, there are some uh, websites out there that are, they kind of like um, create a platform for creating your own website, you know, things like Artspan or some of those others. What's your take on those? I mean, do they offer enough flexibility or, or are they just not worth it? You know, I think it's always this kind of um, like, pros cons thing. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of these portfolio websites and some of them are really good. I think I would, the first thing I do is I look at who else, you know, what's the work on the site? Do I feel like, like the same way I might look at a gallery, like, are these, is this a, is this a community that, you know, my work feels like it's, in, you know, compatible with, are these artists that I would love to show with that kind of thing is one. The other one I would is because some of them are fairly expensive. Do you know what I mean? So if like art fair, I think it's fairly expensive, right? It's a good website and they have, you know, really interesting artists, but I'm wondering like, what are they doing? Um, what are they doing for the artists? Like how visible are the individual artists in, in those kinds of big portfolio um, websites? So I think we have to, you know, it's like the attention economy or like, where do I want to focus my energy and my money? I mean, <laughs> this is real. These are real things for us artists, working artists, like all of you, right? I'm a working artist. I don't have endless income that I can spend on these things. So I would really do like an analysis of that site. You might even like reach out to artists that are on there and say, you know, what's your experience been? Have they, you know, is that work just sitting? You know what I mean? Like some of those sites, I think the work just sits there, right? And doesn't get seen. What are they doing to help that work get seen? Um, is it an active community? You know, like, are there people that you're going to be engaging with, like some of the, you know, online communities that have been popping up, right, um, where people are gathering together and pu putting shows together? That might be really productive. Um, so I feel like it's really a mixed bag. There's a lot of them, and I think that on many of them, the work sits there and is not that visible. Um, so that's the way I would calculate it. And I do think that there are times where you're like, okay, for this year, I'm going to commit to 
Um, like I'm not a big fan of jury exhibitions, right? I, even though I've been a juror many times, I've always asked them to do something. Like, I don't think it's really ethical for the artists who don't get in the show to be the ones funding the exhibition. I think that's just inherently unethical. Um, and yet it's the system we have. So I think that, um, you know, we can find ways to, so when I'm talking to people, I don't say don't do a jury show, but like, look really carefully. Who's the juror? What's the venue? Are they going to do stuff for the artists? You know, are they paying for their, you know, their lights and their rent with it? Then, you know, maybe that's problematic. Maybe it's not. There are exceptions, right? Like the painting center is a, is a, is a pay to play place, but they do a lot of really good stuff for the artists. They create a real community. You know what I mean? So there are good reasons. So one might say, I'm going to invest in this for a period of time. Um, you know, like I'm going to invest in this organization or this portfolio site or whatever for, you know, I'm going to give it two years and I'm going to really work it right myself in every way I can put links on my website, post it on social media, all these torturous things that we have to do as artists um, and, um, and see if it, you know, if it's valuable, but it does, you know, I mean, again, this is like, it's all, it's this myth of like, <laughs> you know, the myth of the, um, of the of the gig economy right that suddenly we'll all be able to do all these things but yeah that means we have to do all these things so it's a lot of um it's a lot of work and i think we have to be pretty careful and um to consider where we're placing our attention and our on our funds <laughs> i know long convoluted answer to a simple question but these these things are these these ecosystems are complicated i also think that it's really um powerful for artists to create their own ecosystems right which is what i've done i was like when I started map space, I was young. I was like, I don't know anything about these things. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to start a space and start showing work. And, and it, you know, it ended up in very productive and, and wonderful exhibitions and, you know, reviews and everything else, because I was like, I don't know how to get into that thing. So I'm going to create my own, my own, um, my own ecosystem, if you will. Yes. Uh, Marianne. You're muted. I have my, my, this is my crit lab thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are still muted. Marianne, you're muted. <laughs> okay, I unmuted and it went back. Okay. Um, I'm interested in the fact that you say a little wall is, is helpful. But if you already have 100 images photographed and on the website and they were photographed against dirty walls, it would be re-photographing everything and redoing it. Or if you add new ones in it, they're not going to match. It's going to look weird. No, I think that, it, no, I, I don't think that any of us have that kind of time, money and bandwidth no. to go back and re-photograph things. I'm not, I'm saying moving forward, I don't think it matters that you have some cropped and some not cropped. That's oh, really mine. Okay. Also, you know, we, you probably on your website don't want to have hundreds of images, right? Like, I think that we want to keep the website more current, decide what's, what we want to be visible, not have like to overwhelm people with um, right. stuff and like that. But I, I mean, I understand we have hundreds of images because we, you know, we live- I, we I live was being life. metaphoric. So yeah. I don't think I have hundreds, but yeah, no, no. I, yeah, I, I think, just wanted no, to know I, that. I, I don't think you need, anyone imagine. needs to go back. Okay. I don't think you need to relitigate that. I just think moving forward, <laughs> um, I would use that. And I don't think it matters that they're different. And I don't think a dirty wall is the worst thing because you're not showing very much of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe a minute or two more, but it's already, we've already kept you here a long time. Um, right, I love to talk to artists. So yeah, we I can stay till 11.15 and-, and Okay, and then- If we'll you want, <laughs> I can also go now. <laughs> no, you're so generous. It's, it's really wonderful. Is, are there any other questions, burning questions? Or do we have to mull it over? Eugenio. Oh, yes. I was wondering. I think Eugenio and then Hilario. Excuse me. I was wondering how many bodies of work uh, do you recommend? Uh, a limited amount and uh, to intrigue uh, the viewer or several bodies of work that might or might not relate to one another? I, I think that, you know, the number is is really dependent. I know I keep saying this, like there's, you know, like I'm, I'm not hedging, I'm really being honest. There's no magical number. I think that it's one of the things you can do is have an archive page, right? Where you put 
older projects so that they're still on the website people can still see because some of us have long careers we've made a lot of things and yet we don't we want the things that are really in play for us to be the things that are most visible um i mean i have a friend who says i don't put anything on my website that's older than five years i'm not that <laughs> i'm not that severe in my um because i also work on projects sometimes over multiple times but i do think you don't want to have you know just to kind of doom scroll of images, right? Like that people find it hard to weed through. So I think organ, I mean, it's really about curating. It's really a curatorial question. Your work on the website wants to be curated by you. Um, and you can also get you know feedback from other people. So the curating means that you're organizing the ideas in a way that make it you know, interesting and fun for people to look at it and not sort of just like too many things or confusing or not making sense and all that. That's a curatorial question. Um, Eugene, so, uh, it's uh, yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, it's wonderful. Um, and I have many questions, but I'll choose one. And that is when you have a group going and you're a kind of a moderator, how do you deal with, uh, where people might be reliving some of the stuff that has I I saw go on in graduate school where people get put down or something gets you know you have to be reduced to you know, do this like a, very negative yeah kind of I don't comment. allow it I don't allow it I think it's when like, um, um, I don't allow it. it I don't allow the I negative I think it's Pauline who is unmuted now. She, <laughs> I don't allow it. Simple as that. Because we don't, uh, because I, and that's what the language pedagogy does. It's never happened. It's never in like, I've been doing this since 2013. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, we don't have, you know, that we're not like, we don't leave our, we bring our whole selves to the room, right? Our emotional selves, our artistic selves, all of that. Or, it's all in the room and I welcome it. And I'm, I am also, quite comfortable having any kind of conversation that people want to have, but it is framed inside a kind of language pedagogy that keeps it focused on the work, like how this is functioning inside the work. And it's not about the artist. And I'm really, you know, really, really, um, that's really important to me because of exactly what you said. Like some of my experiences where people just sort of off the cuff, you know, I always say like drop a dookie in your studio. Do you know what I mean? Excuse my French, but um, you know what I mean? Like it can be really, it can really knock you off your bicycle. You know what I mean? It can really be really difficult. Um, we record all the sessions so people can listen to them again um, with a thoughtful thing. I record all the chats, the chats are really active. Um, so I think the framework keeps it from ever getting kind of personal in that way, right? And bridging that, um, that kind of line. Uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't get personal in, this, in, like, in the sense of getting deep, right? And people often, you know, people are living, like you bring your whole, your whole life, like life is happening at the same time that we're making art, right? There's, there's loss, there's trauma, there's the world, and those things come up. Um, and, but it's not, it's in, in, in relationship to the work. So I think if you you can certainly talk to anyone who's in the lab about this particular thing because um, and you know I'm sure that they would be happy to talk to you um, because you know hearing it from me is like you know yes you believe that but um, I do think it's true I mean I really think that the, that's why structure is so important and I'm really strict about it I mean we you, we do it with a lot what I say is like a lot you know a lot of humor and compassion because people still say I like it's not like I'm like you know you don't get sent out of the room it's just sort of like you know let's retrain that refocus it towards the work. Um, because it's really powerful to do that. Thank you. Right, um, Lois, let's have Lois be the last question. One last question. Then we have to end the meeting. But... I can't, I think Lois is- you're muted, hold up your, I'm gonna, I gotta make a sign like that. <laughs> I know, because who, who wants to hear yourself saying over and over again, you're muted. So I made a little paddle. Sue, are you ready? Visual, visual. Um, I. <laughs> Very enlightening, everything you've mentioned. Um, so when you do new work, do you have any kind of uh, tips for that kind of uh, presentation of the new that you prefer or you see is successful? Is successful? I'm, I'm, well, let me see if I understand your question. So like new work for you that you're really excited about? What? Yes? Oh, yeah. Um, I think, you know, again, you get to decide what's visible, right? So I might take some, 
I might have an archive page where I can keep projects that are, you know, still important to me and I want to be there, but I don't want to be like in the primary space. Um, you, I would just organize it in the order that is important to you. Like, especially like this is a really good example of why when media might not be a good organizing principle, right? Because it just puts everything that is, you know, sculptural together. Whereas you might have organize it by projects might be a way to do that. And then that's the first project that pops up. You know, we have a lot of agency and I think sometimes we feel a little bit like, you know, caught in these systems, which we kind of are, but I think that we can organize things in a way that um, are empowering and meaningful for us. Like you have to look at the website and say, what is meaningful to me to be visible um, in this? Thank so you. I see what well, I see Maria has a question. Well, one last question. <laughs> Then I really do have to go because I have another meeting. <laughs> I'm sorry. It may be kind of a complicated question, but you don't, you bring in everybody to a crit group, you form the groups and you have the language boundaries, but you know, having for someone like me, that was, is a bit PTSD from my MFA program. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that you're doing. Yeah. But what I wonder is then how do you create form a situation where you're not the only one really talking because in reality there are these boundaries for language and you can't um, control other people and what they might say and then how limited they would be and what they could say. So um, yeah, it, it, I mean, all good questions. And I, I think that there are a lot of people who have MFA trauma <laughs> and there are a lot of people with MFAs in the, in the lab. Uh, but people want to talk about their work because it's thrilling. It's exciting. Like what could be better than sit in a room and talk about your work with other artists? I mean, it's the best, you know, this is our tribe, right? Um, I think that I don't talk all through the thing. I generally wait till the last 10 minutes or so to even really chime in. The first 20, 25 minutes is pretty much the group. In the beginning, I do, I also do an orientation session for anybody who's new. It's like an hour a little over an hour orientation to kind of talk about the language structure, to talk about the, you know, the whole pedagogy, so that people come in the room understanding what's going on. And we don't have to spend the actual critique session doing that because there's mixtures of people who are returning or new or whatever. Um, and, and mixtures of like familiarity with, you know, this kind of language. And, and I wanna say really clearly that the language structure is not a limitation, right? It's a way of like, like turning the focus towards the work rather than towards the artist. So you don't, you're not limited in what, what you can talk about. It's just sort of like, if you said, I like this green, I like the green in this work, I might say, well, you know, turn back to the work and talk about the green, what the green is doing. Oh, the green is, you know, it's a neon green that has an electric energy current next to the pink. You know what I mean? Like, that's a really simple example. So it's really kind of, it's not like, oh, you can't say things. It's more like, you know, let's reframe that in relationship to the work. Uh, it also allows like the things that show up in our work that we didn't even know, or we didn't intend, or we didn't, you know, the surprises that, I mean, I think that's one of the most important things about our work. Like if it's not surprising us, it's not surprising anyone. So um, I want to be able to talk about work outside of the artists. And I don't mean the artists don't talk about their, you know, their intent and stuff. It just means that we talk about like, well, here's what this object is doing. How does that relate to your intent? How do you feel like you want to shift it in, in relationship to that? So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's definitely not me talking the whole time. Yeah, and I just find it interesting because it, it, to move away from talking about intent seems absolutely the antithesis of what the art world is doing right now. So, well... Yeah, I mean, I would love to have this conversation because it's related to the, the sort of trends that are going on now and all the kinds of things. And uh, the biggest thing is really, um, I think talking about intent is fine, but the artwork has to function on its own, right? The artwork has to function as an independent, an object independent of your body. And one of the ways that this language helps is it gives us a kind of critical distance. It's really hard to see our own stuff. You know what I mean? It, it helps us to kind of step away and realize we are not our work. It has an independence, it has its own agenda, it has its own grammar and its own kind of desires. If artwork is all a kind of desire, um, it has its own desires and those desires may be a little bit different than, than what we think. And just to wrap this up is that we get to decide what we want to be visible, right? So if you make a thing and everyone's saying, like talking about it in a way that it's like, totally away from your intent. You'd be like, wow, I, I need to rethink some things because my stuff is not visible. You know what I mean? I wanna make it more visible. Um, and 
uh, also just that there's wonderful things that show up that, you know, you didn't expect. Like aprons showed up in my work. I was like, I'm not into aprons. Aprons don't make sense. I'm, you know, aprons, I'm not doing aprons. And, but I was like, oh, okay, well, come in, hang around. And, um, and now aprons are this important component because I didn't, I didn't say, well, that's outside of my vision or my intent. I was like, well, you know, this showed up. Like, let's pay attention to what shows up. So it's complex. It's not, again, it's about thinking of intent as how you make the things that are important to you visible in the work, rather than saying, I make this work because I had a, you know, this or that experience. Because I don't think that's useful to the work. It's useful to us, but that's a therapeutic question, not an artistic question. And no, artists. Yeah, I didn't want to. No, does that make sense? It, it does make sense. I just think there's so much crossover between yeah, the idea of also. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to. Well, anyway, I don't want to. Uh, yeah, no, so I'm happy to. I'm happy to continue that conversation because yes, there's a lot of crossover. The the, the structure is not as I said. It's flexible, and fungible, strong but flexible, fungible. So, it's just a way of helping us to keep focusing back on the work. So I'd be happy to, you know, if you if you wanted to reach out to me to to continue conversations, I'd be happy to do so. And um, thank you so much for your. Oh. You're, thank you. Round of applause. Round of applause, Patricia. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to, uh, to have joined you today. So yeah, and thank you so much. and I and I think a number of us. You might be seeing a number of us. Thank I'm you. Happy to, I'm happy to talk about anything. I always say. <laughs> okay, but I am going to end the meeting because it's very late, and a lot of us, including myself, have other things I have to do. But this was so fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And this was uh, like a header between the crit group. A double and header. The yes, it was like a double header. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And thank you, David, in advance for your great notes you're going to share with us from all of this. My pleasure. Thank you yeah. so much. Ciao, ciao. Okay. Bye. Thank you.